Lord says about this year that we are in, this year that's upcoming. Look with me at Luke 4, 16 through 21. We're going to look at parts of it. This is after Jesus has been in the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. We want Jesus to lead us to mountaintops. Uh, we want the Spirit to lead us to mountaintops, but often the Holy Spirit leads us into places of isolation where he does things in our lives that he can do in no other place. And so Jesus had been in the wilderness. He had fasted during that time. He had faced and had successfully overcome every temptation that the enemy had thrown him, thrown at him. And that encourages me because the spirit of Jesus, the life of Jesus lives in us this morning. And because Jesus overcame and he lives in us, we too may overcome. We too may overcome. Amen. So Jesus at this time, he goes back to Nazareth. Um, this was his hometown. This was his boyhood home. He was born in Bethlehem, but this was his boyhood home. It was further up in the north. It was where he had been brought up. And so everybody knew Jesus, but they didn't know him as Jesus the Messiah. They didn't know him as Jesus Lord. Um, they knew him as Jesus, the carpenter's son and the carpenter himself. We know him. But already word had begun to spread about his teaching and about some of, uh, some people believe he'd already begun working miracles at this point. And so it was, a, in a way, it was almost like a uh, small, town, small town boy makes good. He comes back to his hometown. He goes into the synagogue. Um, as usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. I was encouraged as I read that because, you know, a lot of times, we often have a lot of criticisms to make about church, don't we? Well, if only it were like this, if only whatever, if it was whatever, then I would go or, or whatever. Look, this was Jesus. Can you imagine what Jesus, the Son of God, felt when he went into a synagogue, all the legalism and all the whatever, and yet it was his custom. He still, he went. And so the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. At this point, he was back. He was visiting them. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. Some Bible scholars say that Jesus chose this passage himself. Many others say, no, it was divinely ordained of the Holy Spirit that this was the reading for the day from the Old Testament prophets. And the Holy Spirit completely and divinely ordained and orchestrated this moment in time when Jesus walked in and he read the words from Isaiah, which were about him. And so the passage was from Isaiah 61. This is what we're going to talk about this morning. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So you already see where we're going, don't you? The year of the Lord's favor. Now, for the people in the synagogue, at the, the men in the synagogue and others, as they heard Jesus reading these, these words, there would have been nothing peculiar or particular about these words. They had been to synagogue every Sabbath day, on a Saturday, every Sabbath day. They would have known, most of them would have known these words by heart. This was something that was very dear to him, dear to them, because this was a passage that was about the time of the Messiah, that one day the Messiah would come and they and the Messiah would set his people free. He would usher in the time of the Lord's favor. They would be free. They would enjoy the blessings of the Lord. And all of Israel looked forward to this time. One day the Messiah is coming. So Jesus reads these words, nothing particular, but then what happens next? He rolled up the scroll, gave it back, sat down. He didn't sit back down in the congregation, but they would stand to read the word, to the Old Testament scripture, to honor the word of the Lord. And then if someone was going to teach or speak on what had just been written, uh, uh, read, they would sit down in a different place and then they would sit down and teach. And that's what Jesus does. So they know, oh, Jesus is going to say something. Jesus is going to talk about the scripture that he's just read. And here's the bombshell. Here's the bombshell, verse 21. He began by saying to them, Today as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. And so this morning I want us to talk for just a little while, not about the year of the rat, but about the year of the Lord's favor.
Amen? And this is what the Lord, I, so clearly, the Holy Spirit leads us, leads us in different ways when we're preparing messages. This was so clear. The Holy Spirit just spoke these words to me. It's the year of the Lord's favor. And so let's talk about this this morning. Um, it's much more meaningful to us than the year of the rat. What does the year of the Lord's favor mean to you and mean to me this morning? And we're going to talk about that. It's very, very clear. So the setting is in Nazareth. This is his hometown. It's not even Jerusalem. Remember that at this point there was no New Testament scripture yet. Uh, people did not realize it, but Jesus himself was the New Testament because he was full of grace and truth. Um, when Jesus celebrates uh, the Passover and then the, the cup and the bread. Remember what Jesus said when we celebrate communion? This is the new covenant in my blood. Remember me. And so Jesus was instituting something new, but what people didn't realize already at this time, Jesus in his life, in himself, was already the New Testament, but they didn't recognize it. All they had was Old Testament scripture that was looking forward to some time. And so here's the bombshell. Jesus reads this, pa this passage, and what he says is, today's you're listening, this prophecy is fulfilled. In other words, I am the one sent from God. I am the one anointed with the Spirit. I am the one who preaches and proclaims good news and freedom and recovery of sight to the blind. And because he has the anointing, this, those of you that have, though I think none of us here have questions about it, but sometimes when people have questions about the Trinity and they say, oh yeah, but you know, the Bible doesn't show this or that or whatever, here's a perfect passage right now. Um, and you, we don't even notice it at first, but it's when the, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Holy Spirit, for He, God, has anointed me, the Son, to do this. And so we see this, and you know what, brothers and sisters, as I was looking at this, that's one of the works of the Holy Spirit. We sometimes get freaked out a little bit about, who the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. Here's a perfect work of the Holy Spirit right now. The Holy Spirit takes what is written. The Holy Spirit takes the words that you and I go to, and we try to go every day, don't we, to the Word of God. And sometimes the words feel so dry and dusty, right? It, I know it's the Lord's Word, but there's, it's, it's not, it, it's, it, does, it doesn't feel like it's ministering to me. It doesn't feel like it's speaking to me. One of the works of the Holy Spirit is to take the written Word, the written inspired Word of God, and breathe life into it and apply it to our hearts and our lives and our situations. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit has come to do. The, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when He comes, He will remind you of everything I've said. He will lead you into truth. The Holy Spirit will talk about Jesus. And so if in your life, in these areas, you feel like, I'm not there yet. It's dry. I'm not getting it. When you come to the Word of God, when you come to prayer, you may simply, honestly, simply just say, Holy Spirit, would you help me this morning? Holy Spirit, would you speak to me through these words? They're all your words. They're all the inspired words. But Lord, would you speak to me again in a fresh and a new way? And this is what we see here. As Jesus said, these words are fulfilled this morning. The Holy Spirit came, gave it power and life and application at that moment. Amen. Amen. That's right, Steve. And so, as Jesus spoke, these words were explosive to the congregation. We look back in high, hindsight, it's not a big deal to us, is it? It's like, oh, yeah, 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 I know that. In fact, a lot of us have this sort of memorized as well. But it was explosive for that Jewish audience because what Jesus was saying was, I haven't just come to tell about God. I have come from God. I'm the anointed one. I am Jesus a lot of people had the name Jesus. Old Testament word, name, uh, same name, Joshua. And it meant Savior or Deliverer. And then his, his name, his title name, Christ. What is Christ? Christ is the Anointed One, right? The Anointed One. The one that is, that is anointed what? In what way? By the Holy Spirit. Or in the Old Testament, anointed by oil, a symbol of the Spirit that meant I am chosen by God, I am equipped by God, I am sent by God, I am anointed by God to do the work that God has called me to do. And that's what Jesus was saying that morning. So these words were explosive as he spoke. And Jesus was saying basically 700 years ago when Isaiah 700, and, uh, this time is maybe... 28, 29, 
AD or so at that point, and the words of Isaiah were written around 740 BC or so. So this was almost 800 years earlier, and Jesus says, he's talking about me. He's talking about me. Oh, brothers and sisters, when we come to the Word of God, may we never look at the Word of God just as ancient history. In the Word of God is life for you and me. And so here we talk about this today. This sounds really great to us as we look at it um, and as we think about it. And we're going to come back to some of these specifics. But I have a question because as I talk about it, some of you may be thinking, well, Pastor, that's great, but that sounds very Jewish to me. Uh, the Messiah has come and it's Isaiah the prophet. Ah, yeah, 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 I know all that, but that's very Jewish. And Jesus said the year of the Lord's favor. So uh, is it for me uh, and is it still valid? for this time. And so as we look at this, the, the, here's some questions for us. So is the declaration of the year of the Lord's favor for you and me this morning or is it just for Jews? We can answer that one really easily. And then there's a second question as well. So we've just gone through Christmas, right? Is this still the year of the Lord's favor? Do you know that the Christmas story, the birth of Christ, gives us the answer for this? Remember, the, angel, the uh, shepherds were out in the field and Jesus was born and God sent most likely Gabriel we don't know but he was the messenger angel because he said he appears to others related to the birth of Jesus so that's likely who it is but we don't know we'll know for sure when we get to heaven look with me again at this passage that we read at Christmas time what does the angel say do not be afraid for behold I bring you what good news of great joy that will be for all the people all the people. Je Jesus was a Jewish baby born into a Jewish family, born in Bethlehem, the city of David. But he was good news for all the people. For all the people. This is Luke chapter 2. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Do you already see some of the echoes from what Jesus just said? So we've gone back 30 years. We're going to go back 700 years, and then we're going to go back about 1,400 years. We're going to get there this morning. We're, we're reverse chronological order this morning um, as we talk about the year of the Lord's favor. This will be a sign. We know all of this. And then the sky is filled, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, what? Peace to those on whom his favor rests. We already see the connections, don't we? So this was at the birth of Jesus, a savior, a deliverer, and peace to those on whom his favor rests. And Jesus begins his ministry 30 years later, 30, 31, um, by the time he says this. And he says to everyone, it's the year of the Lord's favor. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. If you have any questions, about this. You know, you've heard me talking a lot about this in recent weeks as I have been preaching, but I feel like the Holy Spirit has been prompting my heart again and again because I believe some of us still are struggling with condemnation, we're struggling with guilt, we're struggling with feelings that I think God is not really happy with me, I think God's a little bit angry at me, I've, I've not been doing what I know I should be doing. And God does call us to live in a way that honors Him. But brothers and sisters, the Bible could not be any more clear. There's no condemnation to those who are in, in Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, Jesus didn't, co didn't come into the world to condemn the world. So this morning, if you have a hint, if you have a speck of condemnation in your heart, and that's what you're feeling, or judgment didn't come from God, it didn't come from God. You are living in the year of the Lord's favor. You are. But some of you may say, yes, but Jesus said it's the year of the Lord's favor. Is that year gone? Is the time passed? Is it already over? Uh, do you know some of the early church fathers? I think uh, Tertu those of you that study church history, Origen and Tert Tertullian and some others, they believe that when Jesus said this, he meant he only was going to minister for one year. And they really believe that. But very clearly, that's not the case, is it? And so here's question two. Is it still the year of the Lord's favor? Or is it kind of like the year of the rat? A year from now, it's going to be the end of the year of the rat. And we're going to go into whatever the next year is. I don't know uh, yet. 
Um, do you know what? God the Holy Spirit knew that people would struggle with timing. You know that? How many of you have ever felt the time's not right yet for me to respond to God? I'm waiting for a special feeling. I'm waiting for a special sign. Some of you are struggling with the feeling, I've missed it. I've already gone too far. God has touched my heart several times and I haven't responded. And I know I should have responded, but I didn't respond. And so I wonder if I have missed it. Do you know what? Those are all things that come from the enemy. And they're designed to keep you from coming to God and from responding to God. The great thing is, God knows the devil's tricks. Did you know that? He knows every trick of the enemy. And so God issued a preemptive strike against the enemy's work. He did. You say, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. He filled his word. He filled his word with encouragements about timing for you and for me. Look with me at just one. There are many, many more. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, who, by the way, had blown it a bunch of times, right? If any church group, if any church in the New Testament had kind of messed up and had been scolded off and on, who was it? Which church was it? Corinth. It really was. It was Corinth. Look at what Paul says. He says, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Now, some of us are saying, is it just the right time? Is it the day of salvation? Here's what Paul tells us. Behold! or pay attention, look, that's what he's saying. Now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So I wanna say something to you this morning, brothers and sisters, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. If you've been waiting for the right time, now's the right time. If you've, been, if you've been worrying, I think I've blown it. I think I've missed it. I think I've gone too far. I think it's too late. I think there's no hope for me. Paul says, inspired of the Holy Spirit, now is the day of salvation. Now is the right time. This morning, this is the right time, brothers and sisters, as the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart. And this is just one passage of many. There are many, many more. Many, many more. And so it answers, it, it answers in part these questions. Is it just for Jews? Is it just for me? Is the time now or is it another time? We're going to answer that question uh, or is the time past? We're going to go a little bit further with that. Jesus reads from Isaiah and he reads from Isaiah 61, but he also reads from Isaiah, I think it's 48. We'll look at it in just a minute. Uh, and who, who, writes, who writes Luke? Luke? <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> Some of you are a little bit slow this morning. You are kind of, uh, uh, Matthew? No. <laughs> Luke, the Gospel of Luke. You know what's great about this being recorded in the Gospel of Luke? Luke, of the four Gospels, was the one who wrote for a more Gentile audience than any of the others, than Matthew, Mark, and John. He wrote, he, his, tar, his goal, his target, it was skewed more towards a Gentile audience, which is great for us. So Jesus stands up, he reads from Isaiah, and let's look at the passage again. Uh, yeah, Isaiah uh, 42, 7. When Jesus read, he actually included um, from Isaiah 42. He brought it in. Luke maybe perhaps gives a summary. Let's look at it again. The Spirit of the Lord God uh, is, upon, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, pro to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. This is where Jesus brings it in from Isaiah 42. And to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, look with me at verse 2. The question is, is it still for now? to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And notice how this verse, notice where I've ended in this verse. What is, those of you, anybody can answer this one. Don't, don't have to have a degree in English. What's right there? <clears throat> comma, comma. It's not a period. This passage is not finished yet, but it is yet recorded that when Jesus read from this passage, that's where he stopped. That's where he stopped. Was Jesus careless? Was he 
a little bit lazy? Did Jesus forget what the rest of the passage was and did he miss it? This answers the question if the year of the Lord's favor is still for now. You ready? From the passage in Isaiah 61. Here's the rest of this. Here's the rest of this verse. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. I mean it. Praise the Lord. If you feel that you're living under the disfavor of God, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the condemnation of God, Jesus himself, when he said, it is the year proclaimed and announcing, it's the year of the Lord's favor, he stopped and did not say, and the day of vengeance of our God. When Jesus comes again, when he comes again, there will be judgment. There will be judgment. The Bible makes that clear, very, very clear. But brothers and sisters, today is the year of the Lord's favor. You are not living under the wrath of God, nor under the condemnation of God. You are living in the offer of grace and salvation and help and healing from our Lord God. It is the year of the Lord's favor. And we are still in that time until the time comes when vengeance is comes on the earth and that's yet ahead it hasn't come there yet and so Jesus not carelessly he didn't forget that part he stopped because we're still in the year of the Lord's favor now you don't look very excited about that but I was really excited when I got to that point I mean it I mean it praise the Lord when the enemy comes to you and condemns you and says oh you've blown it again you're this you're that you, you look, you say, but I'm in the year of the Lord's favor. Does it matter that we failed, that we've fallen, that we've blown it? Yes, it does. The Lord wants us to live holy lives. But do you think, let me ask you, you think the condemnation and the judgment of God is going to help you and strengthen you to live a holy life that honors Him? No. God gives us His mercy and He gives us His grace so that we can get up and walk in the strength of the Lord again. We are in the year of the Lord's favor. This is a, here we are in 2020, this is a 2,000-year-old pause, brothers and sisters. It's a 2,000-year comma. We're, we're living in the year of the Lord's favor. And so is this, question number one, is it still the year of the Lord's favor? Uh, question number two, is it still the year of the Lord's favor? Yep, yes. sure it is. Question number one, is all this for me? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So let's look at some of these things this morning. I'm going to look from the Isaiah passage. We're going to look first at Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is, of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Do you see some things in this passage that you need this morning from the year of the Lord's favor? I do. I don't know about you. I do. And so we look at this one first. Good news to the poor. The word that's used here is a very, very special word. It's different from the regular word for poor. Um, how many of you feel poor this morning? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Poor in pocket. Poor in pocket this morning. Let me, let me be a little more specific. Poor in pocket. Some you don't. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We kind of, we don't want to raise our hands. But may I say something to you this morning? Unless I really don't know you very well, not one of you fits in this category right here because this was a really special word and this word means not just poor this word means absolutely destitute literally you have there's you have nothing you don't have food to put in your mouth in the picture of Lazarus that was under the table and he was eating the crumbs uh, uh, that, that were dropping that the dogs were eating it's the same word that's used it is to be so you have you have nothing. Your, your next bite will depend on others. You don't have it for yourself. In, in, a, in a classical Greek, when they would use this word, it would mean it described a beggar. Now, you know, Hong Kong has uh, beggars here and there in various, and, and I know there are all sorts of issues related to that. When I lived in China, in Beijing, until they later began to uh, not let, and Keith would remember that, uh, downtown, um, downtown uh, Beijing because we were there at the same time as beggars began to increase until the government kind of pushed them out of the way because it was it was a bad image um, beggars would really lie in that area because there were a lot of people uh, with more means that would come in that area but we see this in Hong Kong sometimes as well how many of you when you have seen a, a beggar the beggar is bold and bright and cheerful 
and his, and his face is lifted and his eyes are open and he puts out his hand and he says, please, I'm in such desperate need. Would you give to me? That doesn't describe beggars, does it? And the picture, that's, that the, the word literally means somebody who cowers and shrinks back because they are so broken and destitute by their poverty. And it was literally, the picture was literally of putting one hand out to receive and asking for help and with the other covering their face in shame. That's what that word is mean. That's that's what that word means. That's how it's used. And so Jesus says, I have come to preach good news to the poor. And some of us this morning feel like, well, that doesn't really describe me. Jesus was talking about not only physical, but he was talking about spiritual things as well. Because when we are self-sufficient, when we feel like, hey, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. When we feel like, I'm, I'm worthy. Look, Lord, I'm serving you. Look what I've done for you. When we are self-sufficient, we can't receive much from God, can we? Because our hearts are full of ourselves. Our hands are full of our own gifts. Our arms are full of our own strength that we can do. But the one who is poor, who comes and says, Oh, God, oh, God, I need you. How many of you have ever struggled with something and you have just fallen and you've just said, oh God. And it was in that moment that you realized, I don't have anything. God, I'm desperate. God, if you don't help me, I won't be helped. Here's the good news that Jesus says to you in the year of the Lord's favor. I've come to give you good news. I've come to you. I've come for you. I've come to help you. This is the good news of the, um, that Jesus preached to the poor then and now as well. This is the good news. And then next, it's included, not in all of it, but he says, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And I was thinking about that because the word brokenhearted actually means to be broken or to be shattered into pieces a heart that's shattered into pieces. And it can also mean a mind that is broken into pieces by care and by sorrow. And I was thinking of us in Lighthouse and some who are going through things like, like this right now. And some of us feel that way, don't we? I think some of us are going through that as we go through the things of life. And I, I love this part of this Messianic passage because it's this one that Isaiah is inspired to write more about. Because right after this, in the verses that come, look with me, and I, I felt I must read this passage to you this morning. This is in the same passage, but he talks further about the brokenhearted. To comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his glory. When we go through great grief, we feel like anything but an oak of righteousness, don't we? We feel so pulled apart. We feel so inadequate. We feel scattered. And Jesus said, when I come, I will heal the brokenhearted. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes it takes time. But the word to heal the brokenhearted, do you know what this word means? It means to take the pieces and the shattered parts and to bind them together again. Isn't that a beautiful picture? To take all of those broken pieces and to bring them back together again. That's what he does in the year of the Lord's favor. I've told you before, and I, I'm, I'm watching the time. I, I, we'll get as far as we can. Some of you, uh, I, I've told you before about, uh, I've given you the story of Gojigit uh, from Singapore many, many years ago. By the time I knew her, uh, she was already a Christian. She was the Bible lady of the church in Singapore. And um, you've heard mom and dad tell this, mom especially, tell this story as well. Uh, this was back in the early years in Singapore when sometimes people had more than one wife. And, and um, Gojigit had, was married and she had a child. This was, I think, in the, in the 50s in Singapore, in the 1950s. She had a child. And when the child was born, 
after that she went into a terrible depression, a postpartum depression, that these days we understand and we know that there's help for it. We know that it's a medical condition. We know that there is, there are, there's, there's a therapy for it, there's medication for it and things like that. In those years there was nothing like that. All they knew was that she's depressed and, she's, and it got worse and worse and worse until all she could do was cry. And through grief and sorrow, she basically lost her mind. And so the family, there were other children as well, the family put her into a men mental institution and she was there for years, for years. And all she did in the mental institution was cry, day after day, month after month, year after year, broken hearted, in a, in a, in a, in a prison of sorrow. And then somebody visited, we don't even know who it was, and left a Bible by her bedside. And Gojiki one day picked up the Bible and began to read the Bible. Began in Genesis. We like the Psalms or other things like that. She just began in Genesis. She didn't know anything. Probably a Buddhist or a Taoist background. Began in Genesis and read all the way through Revelation, crying the whole time. And then she started again. She was in a mental institution. What, she was, gonna, what was she going to do? What was she going to read? And by the end of the second, by the, I think by the end of the first reading, she had stopped crying. By the end of the second time through the Word of God, she was completely restored in heart and in thoughts and in mind to full health. That's what Jesus does. He heals the brokenhearted. He takes the pieces that are just shattered and broken and brings them back together again. She got out of the mental institution, but in the meantime, her husband had abandoned her and he had remarried because, oh, especially in those days, so shameful, somebody in a mental institution, family abandoned her, the children rejected her, and, they, and those who knew her feared, oh no, what will she do now? She's gone back, she's lost her family, she's lost her marriage, she will, she'll go back down again. But from that, the Lord took that, she, she was made a what? An oak of righteousness. A planting of the Lord and he established her and she became a blessing in the church because the Lord took the broken pieces and put them back together again and made something for his glory and for her good beloved Jesus still does that today he still does that today if your heart or your thoughts or your life you feel like it's broken into pieces, bring them to the Lord and let him heal the brokenhearted in heart and mind. And he will make you an oak of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. This is what he does in the year of his, of his favor, of the Lord's favor. Praise the Lord. I don't have time to remind you of the story because I do want to go just a little bit further as we get through this. I don't have time to remind you this morning of the story of Pastor Moore and what God has brought out of her life, but it was a broken life. Everything destroyed in her life and God has brought out of that. She's an oak of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. Beloved, the Spirit of the Lord is upon Jesus and He is here. He is here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. So he has sent, Jesus is here to heal the brokenhearted through the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim liberty to the captives. Oh, brothers and sisters, think about that. Remember when you were a slave to sin? Remember when you tried to be better and you couldn't be better? Remember when you determined, I'm not going to do that again, and you did it again? Sadly, that describes how we are sometimes as Christians as well. Because you and I know that even as Christians, now this is a message for those who don't yet know Jesus and who have not yet been set free from the clutches of the enemy. So I want to say to you this morning, if that is you, it's the year of the Lord's favor this morning. He's here to set you free. He's here to set you free. But I want to say something to else, else to those of you this morning who are Christians but are not living with an understanding and living in the, in the time of the Lord's favor. Because you and I as Christians can open the door to sin. We can open the door to sinful thoughts and attitu attitudes and unforgiveness and bitterness. And when it first comes in, it looks small, it seems small, and it feels like, well, yeah, hmm. And, we, and, and it's in our hearts. But if it stays in our hearts and it's not dealt with, and it's not kicked out, and it's not acknowledged, God, this is wrong, I, Lord, they're wrong. 
Yes, but Lord, my attitude's wrong too. And if we let it stay in our hearts, I will tell you what will happen if you don't know it yet. You and I will become a slave to that if it remains in our lives and in our hearts. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a slave. I don't want to be a servant of anyone except the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So if that's you this morning, it's the year of the Lord's favor. Deal with it. Take care of it. Amen? And you, can you do it yourself? You can't do it yourself, but you can bring it to the one who has been anointed to deal with it in your life. And he will deal with it because you and I are in the year of the Lord's favor. Recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus took this from Isaiah 42 instead of from Isaiah 61. How many of you, before you knew Jesus, or when we're living in rebellion, even when we're Christians, you think day is night? You think wrong is right? You're going down this path when you think, I'm choosing my own way, this is my life, and instead you're headed straight for destruction. But when Jesus comes into our lives and into our hearts, he opens our blind eyes and he helps us to see what is real and what is right. Amen. Amen. Oh, there's so many verses that go with this, but we don't have time, right? We've got to come to a close this morning. To release the oppressed. I love this one as well because this release the oppressed, oppressed has to do with those that are overwhelmed by life. Are some of you this morning overwhelmed by life? Are some of you this morning feeling depressed and dark? We all go through ups and downs in our, in our emotions, right? Do any of you ever get up in the morning and you feel like, I'm, I'm not saved today? We all do. I'm not talking about that. Don't let your feelings be your boss. We all go, but I'm talking about, uh, we're laughing about that, but I'm talking about something more serious. Some of you this morning, listen carefully, some of you this morning are living with a heavy cloud over your head, around you. You feel burdened. You feel heavy. You feel dark. You feel, I don't have a way ahead. You feel pressure. What I want to say to you is this. If that describes your life this morning, you are living under the oppression of the enemy. It's from the enemy. It's not just a feeling. It's not just this or not just that. What I want to say to you is this. You have gotten used to living that way because you think, well, that's just the way it is. That's just my life. I'm whatever. That's a lie of the enemy this morning, brothers and sisters. It's a lie of the enemy. That is the oppression of the enemy. And Jesus says to you, I have come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's for you and it's for now. And I've come to release you from that oppression. I've come to release you. So if you're living that, that this morning, you don't have to walk out those doors this morning with that oppression still weighing you down. For the year of the Lord's favor is here. Let him release you this morning. Let him release you to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So very quickly, oh, <laughs> very quickly, we finish with this this morning. I told you we were going to go reverse chronological order, right? Started with Jesus around 28, 29 AD, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon him. He proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor. Then we went back around 30 years to his birth, right? When the angels said, This is good news for all people, uh, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Jesus read from Isaiah 61, and it was, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We've just looked at that. That was almost 800 years. Now, just in closing, very quickly, and then you're going to look at it on your own if the Lord is speaking to you this morning. Everybody, when they heard Jesus, knew what the year of the Lord's favor. Do you know what the year of the Lord's favor was in their understanding also? It was an idiom that meant the year of Jubilee. Did you know that? It was an idiom that meant the year of Jubilee. Now, those of you from a Catholic background this morning, you go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, the year of Jubilee. Uh, the Pope in Rome, uh, occasionally, he proclaims the year of Jubilee, right? And he remits this, and he does that, and he does so forth and so on. Without stepping on anybody's toes, may I say to you this morning that the only one who can remit sin, the only one who can proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the only one who has been anointed to do all of this is Jesus Christ himself. He's the Messiah. He's the one sent from God. And He's here through the power of the Holy Spirit to do all of this this morning and to proclaim the year of Jubilee. Okay, let's finish. You say, year of Jubilee? Leviticus 25. You say, what? 
the year of Jubilee, when they went into the promised land, God told Moses, when you go into the promised land, this is what I want you to do. On every 50 years, you're going to blow a trumpet throughout the whole land. What did Jesus do when he stood in the synagogue that morning? I proclaim to you, he blew a trumpet. He blew a trumpet. And this is what happens. In this way, you shall set the 50th year apart, proclaim freedom to all the inhabitants of the land. During this year, all property that has been sold shall be restored to the original owner or the descendants, and any who have been sold as slaves shall return to their families. Now, brothers and sisters, we end on a high note this morning because the year of the Lord's favor was understood. It's the year of Jubilee. And what happens in the year of Jubilee? Jesus said, I've come to do all of these, these things to declare the year of the Lord's favor in the year of the Lord's favor. It was called the year of Jubilee, the year of release is another name. That's what the word exactly means. And what happened in that year? The debts were wiped out. The slate was wiped clean. How many of you would like your slate wiped clean? How many of you would like a fresh start? Jesus provides that for us this morning. You don't have to drag around all the wrong that you've done and all the problems of your past. Jesus takes care of the debt. You see, you ca they came up with debts. They became slaves. They sold themselves into slavery. They ran out of money. They had to sell their land. And once they did that, they were slaves. How can a slave get free? A slave can't get free. How can a slave pay his debts? A slave can't pay his debts. Somebody has to get them free. Somebody has to pay their debts. Somebody has to release them. And Jesus did that. That's the picture of the year of Jubilee. It's not oh, it's some old ancient tradition. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. I love this. I love to... Well, I, I was sitting in the chair in the hair salon on Friday studying while they were doing stuff to my hair so I could look a little bit better this morning as we go into Chinese New Year. I'm laughing, but I really mean it. And I was sitting there, I was reading, and I had my notebook with me while they were doing stuff. And I came to that and I was like, oh, Lord, I almost shouted aloud in the hair salon. But under breath, I was, oh, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Brothers and sisters, in the year of Jubilee, all the property that has been sold returns to the rightful owner. All the slaves that have gone into slavery go back to their home. What does Jesus do for you and me? We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to the enemy. And some of us, even as Christians, we've gotten back into slavery in areas of our lives. But in the year of the Lord's favor, every person that was sold into slavery goes back to the rightful owner. Who's the rightful owner? Jesus. Jesus is the rightful owner. And he offers in the year of the Lord's favor to set us free, to wipe the slate clean, to help us be restored. That's what Jesus does. It is the year of the Lord's favor. Let's pray this morning. We're just going to close in prayer. And as we close in prayer, here, here it is. It's the year of the Lord's favor. I prayed for you yesterday and I prayed for you this morning that you would respond to the Lord and that what you know you need from this proclamation of the year of the Lord's favor, you would receive from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who's here to apply this to your life this morning. So if you, you can close your eyes if you want to. If you want to look at this and just take it in, I've got the, I've got the words here, but we're going to pray, whether with your eyes closed or with your eyes open. It's up to you. I'm going to pray for you. You pray for yourself. And if you want to, you can just raise a hand and say, Lord, I, I, I need the year of your favor pro proclaimed in my life, and I receive it. As Paul said, don't waste this. You've gotten God's grace. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the Lord's time. Now it is. Lord, we come to you this morning. God, we thank you as we look ahead and as we are getting ready to celebrate Chinese New Year and as some that don't know any better are celebrating the year of the rat and they're hoping for a lucky year and they're fearful of an un unlucky year. Lord, we thank you that you have set us free from the traditions of men and of our past and instead as your children we are living in the year of your favor. 
and in the year of your favor, you have come and you offer us. And so we receive this morning the good news to those of us who are poor, the release from captivity, the opening of blind eyes, the healing of broken hearts. Oh, Lord, take the broken pieces of our hearts and of our thoughts and just bind them together again. Lord, make us an oak of righteousness, a planting of you when we thought we would never stand straight again. We would never be able to stand firm again. Bind us up, Lord. Bind us up and bring your healing in this time of your favor. Release from prison, we pray. Release from prison. We can't get ourselves out. We got ourselves in, but Lord, we can't, can't, can't get ourselves out. In the year of your favor, would you release us, we pray. Would you come and do what you said you would do? We receive your your gift of release as we receive you in our lives again. Oh, Jesus, come in and do your work in our lives. Oh, Lord, we need you. We are poor without you. We are destitute without you. We are blind without you. We are brokenhearted without you. Release us, we pray. Release us, we pray. Over, to overcome, release those who are oppressed. Lord, I pray specifically this morning for people who are dealing with oppression and a dark and heavy cloud over their lives. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would break this spirit of oppression that has come from the enemy. I want to encourage you this morning, if that's you, just lift your hands to the Lord this morning as I pray for you. It's not about me. It's not for me. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. Jesus has come this morning. He's here through the power of spirit to release you from this oppression that is from the enemy. You don't have to live with it. You don't have to keep it in your life. Lord, I pray this morning for those who are lifting their hands to you for help. Lord, some of us have reasons for why we feel oppressed. Lord, some of us have no idea why, but nevertheless, we're living under oppression. We lift our hands to you this morning. We cannot get ourselves out of this pit, but we call out to you. <clears throat> Oh, Lord, release us, we pray. Come in this time. Now is the day of salvation. And Lord, would you begin to lift this burden? Would you begin to lift this dark cloud? And may we begin to walk free in you. Show us, oh, Lord, what you would like us to do in spending time with you each day, in taking your word into our lives that will make us strong and that will shut the, the lies of the enemy who tries to keep us under this oppression. Lord, help us to walk in the freedom that you have won for us us, and that we will be free indeed. Release your people, we pray. And Lord, may your people this morning know that this is the year of your favor, that we are free indeed, that you have wiped away the debts, that we can start new, we can start fresh. Lord, other people may point at us and say, oh, you again. Oh, there you go again. But Lord, you never say that. You never do that to us. You say it's the year of Jubilee. And you proclaim it over our lives. And we open our ears to hear the clarion call again of your spirit saying to our spirit, it's the year of the Lord's favor. It's the year of, the, of Jubilee. I wipe the slate clean for you. I set you free. I bind together the broken parts of your heart and of your thoughts. And you shall be a planting of the Lord, an oak of righteousness in the house of the Lord, for your glory and for our good, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.